let me thank uh, everybody for being here. Um, Don George, Don, thanks so much. And Steve Bluff, we thank you for being here. And Jeff McKee and uh, Gina Ackley, thanks a lot. And Dr. Mark Levine uh, as well. Um, let me speak for a few minutes to kind of lay the groundwork of what I'd like to see happen. Then I'd like to give each of you five minutes to make remarks, maybe in response to what I'm saying. Uh, and then we'll open up for discussion, and I'm going to ask you some hard questions. And the main point uh, of today is that health care costs in America are very high. We all know that. It's higher than not. Uh, and we need a sense of urgency that I think we don't have right now. Okay. So let me begin by saying what everybody here knows. The American health care system uh, is broken, and it is dysfunctional. Uh, we are spending twice as much per person on health care as the people of any other nation, including our friends 50 miles to the north, yet our life expectancy is significantly lower. Our health care outcomes are not as good. Uh, in my view, without giving you a long speech, the function of the current health care system is to make huge profits for the drug companies. And you'll all be happy to know that last year, Drug companies made $110 billion in profit, while we pay by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. We'll discuss that. Uh, and for insurance companies who also make billions of profits and give their CEOs outrageously high compensation packages. That's the function of the American healthcare system. Working very well for the companies, not so well for the people who use the systems. Now, in Vermont, uh, our health care costs, as I understand it, oh, and we'll get into this in a minute, are among the highest in the country, uh, and in recent years have been going up rather sharply. Uh, and in a sense, what prompted this discussion today <coughs> is the reality that uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont and MVP Healthcare recently requested double-digit insurance rate increases for individuals who purchase on the Vermont Health Exchange and businesses with under 100 employees. Blue Cross, as I understand it, requested uh, an average rate increase of 16.3% for individual plans and 19.1% for small group plans. Does that sound right, Don? It is correct. Okay. MVP requested uh, average increases of 11.7% for individual plans and 9.3% for small group plans. And Don and I have been chatting in the last few weeks, and he's going to explain to you why he thinks these rate increases are appropriate. I don't. He does. We'll talk about it. Um, I would just simply point out to the people in this room who are major health care players in the state of Vermont, it is no secret to you that property taxes in Vermont are going up. People are rejecting school budgets. Housing costs in Vermont are off the charts. Um, and businesses are under a lot of pressure because of the uh, shortage of workers. So we've got a lot of economic problems in the state of Vermont, and I think I would speak for about 99.9% .9 of Vermonters who are saying that a large increase in health care costs is not exactly what is needed at this time. Um, in terms of Vermont, again, my understanding is that when you compare plans often of Vermont's health exchange, and I know what is being offered differs state by state, uh, hours are high, and we have seen a nearly 60% increase in the past five years. Is that right, Norm? It's 46 to 80% increase over six years on our qualified. Yeah, all right, I'm close enough. <laughs> uh, so the purpose of this discussion is to understand why health care costs in Vermont are as high as they are, and most importantly, what we can do about it. Um, now, we're not going to solve all of the problems, but I want to just identify, and I more or less talk to everybody here about some of them, which I think are obvious. Like we have major crises in the country, but let's take a little bit of a look in Vermont and see where money is being wasted and how we might be able to address it. These are some ideas. You guys probably have some other uh, points you want to make. All right. Steve Alesto, who does a very good job as CEO at UVM Medical Center, and I have chatted about this. A couple of years ago, Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys spent $125 million on traveling nurses. That's correct. It has gone down now, I understand, it's $75 million. Correct. All right, that's a lot of money. And the reason that Steve spent $125 million, that's an astronomical sum of money, 
and that is, tell me if I'm right or wrong here, Steve, I think that's what, two or three times what you would pay a local nurse. That it was, right? that was peak of the pandemic, yes. Okay. And the reason for it is we don't have enough nurses in the state of Vermont. We have nurses in crisis in Vermont, and by the way, around the country. So we are spending huge amounts of money paying people to it. And by the way, it's not just the traveling nurses who come here. I'm nothing against traveling nurses. They do a good job. They are often owned by Wall Street firms who take a big chunk of that money. Okay. So instead of developing our own nursing workforce here in the state of Vermont, people who love the state, who live in the state, we're bringing in other people. You're housing them, right? You're buying housing for them. Very expensive. Question is. What are we doing to address it? I know we're beginning to do something like that. But this is a sense of urgency must be developed in this. Steve and others can talk about what we do. But it is insane to be spending two or three times as much money for a traveling nurse because we don't have our own. We don't have our own because we don't have, we're not paying nurse educators, believe it or not, enough money to educate nurses. Insane. All right? You should be dealing with this issue. All right? Somebody should be dealing with it. And by the way, let me plead guilty on that. You know, I understand that the federal government is also an important part of the problem. Medicaid rates are too low. Medicare rates are too low, and I'm working on that. That is also an important part of the problem. It's not simply Vermont living in a vacuum here. Okay. Steve and I have talked about another issue. And again, not Steve's fault. It is a reality. Steve, correct me if I'm wrong. But you have, I would expect, as we speak right now, dozens of people in the hospital at expensive rates because they are elderly and we don't have adequate nursing home care for them. So we house them in a hospital. You have people there who have psychiatric issues because in the state we are very weak on psychiatric care. And we have people probably with drug addiction issues at the hospital as well. Am I right on those things? All true. Okay. But why is that? Why is it that we don't have adequate nursing homes? So I have a reason for that. But to my mind, and I would suspect everybody agrees, it is appropriate for elderly people to live in comfortable, good nursing homes or assisted living places or home health care, right? Rather than putting them in the hospital where they're being, I don't mean warehouse, I mean, I'm sure they're being well taken care of, but that's not where they're supposed to be, all right? You don't deal with psychiatric problems. You have people, by and large, you know how to We have a psychiatric unit that's full every day and the overflow of patients wait in our ER for either a bed to open up upstairs or somewhere else in Vermont. All right. Point is, we don't, I don't, I had a hearing on this thing, point, what a hearing it was, talking about mental health in the state of Vermont. No one denies that we're woefully inadequate in taking care of people with mental health, serious mental health problems. All right? Mark, that right? Inadequate. I would say woefully. Well, if you were at the hearing that I was at, <laughs> Peter Welch was there, Becky Ballant was there, woefully would be the answer. People were crying. Desperately reaching out to help, they can't find help for mental health issues. All right. Again, the point is not only that we're not treating people with problems appropriately, humanely, we're wasting money. All right. Am I correct in saying that it costs a lot more money to put somebody in your hospital than any nursing home? Right? Thousands and thousands more. Okay. It's insane. What are we doing about it? I want to talk about that. I want answers to that. These are the issues that we need. Emergency room use. Now I get around the country a little bit. I see billboards, billboards, advertising primary care and emergency rooms. Right? I don't see the billboards in Vermont. But no one will deny that there are a lot of people, because of the primary health care crisis that we have, that there are a lot of people who go to the emergency room for what a non-emergency non needs. Best of my understanding, it costs 10 times more. If I have a flu and I go to the emergency room for my flu, it will cost me 10 times more treatment there than if I go to a community health center. Okay, bro. And yet, all over the state, we're making progress with community health centers. We're gaining on it a little bit. But a lot of people are using emergency rooms for primary care, which is much more expensive. Care. Okay, I want to get into that. And, uh, you know, Jeff, we look forward to your thoughts about how we can address that issue. Uh, high cost of prescription drugs. Uh, Don from Blue Cross and I were on the phone just a few days ago uh, talking to the guy who's head of Optum. Optum is one of the major uh, prescription benefit managers uh, in the country, one of the big three. Don, am I correct that your costs are going up by 19% this year for prescription drugs? 
18. 18. Oh, 18. All right. Good. <laughs> right. Now, we already pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. I just told you that the top top 10 companies made $110 billion in profit. Do I think the Blue Cross Blue Shield or Optum are doing anywhere near what they should be doing, or the hospitals for that matter? You told me something to sell me. Steve told me last year, correct me if I'm wrong, what, something like 20% of your budget is for prescription drugs? Yes. Okay. And you have, you mentioned to me one case, serious case from New York State, actually, a woman needed a million dollars of treatment with yes. drugs? Okay. So what are you doing about it? I mean, are you really taking on the drug companies? And you got 340B there, right? Which you make a tidy sum on, right? Less than before, but yes, we still make money. Okay. I mean, again, not to be critical of anybody. This is a national issue, and I know there are explanations for everything. Um, so those are, and then there's another issue uh, which we may want to get into, and, and maybe Owen can help us. Uh, well, before I get to that one, administrative costs. We probably spend twice as much as Canadians do on administrative costs. Steve, do you know how many people you have in the basement building? I don't know the exact number. But my guess is, how many people down do you have who do nothing else but build? We have 425 okay. people that work at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Vermont. Right. None of them are examining children. None of them are dealing with broken legs or heart attacks. We don't write prescriptions. We don't see patients. You just build people and run the system. Well, we do more than that, but... <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I know. I but primarily, you. what you're doing is, you got over 400 people, I'm not here to criticize these other great people doing their jobs. We're in a desperate need of doctors, nurses, dentists, and we've got people who are doing a lot of billing in the basement of your hospital, in Rutland, all over the state, and a Blue Cross Blue Shield. And another issue, a little bit touchy, but let me say this as well. At UVM Medical Center, you have at least 10 administrators who make over half a million dollars a year. You know. uh, Rutland has a hell of a lot as well. Okay. Uh, I was just looking at some numbers yesterday, again, I'm using the Canadian system, which I think it's a better system than ours. Their top administrators get half as much as we do. Uh, and I don't know that it really is appropriate that we pay for that much to administrators. Uh, last point that I would make when we open it up for discussion, um, we have, what, 14 hospitals in the state? To what degree are there duplicative services? Uh, I, I happen to believe in regional hospitals, you know, people want to have their babies at home, et cetera, et cetera, broken legs at home. But I suspect that UVM is doing things that many smaller hospitals can't do or shouldn't do. Maybe Boston is doing some things that UVM shouldn't do, I don't know. But do we have a rational approach toward making sure that people get the highest quality care in the state of Vermont at the in a cost effective way. Maybe only you can speak to that. All right. Those are some of the issues that I had on my plate. You may have others. Uh, let me start off uh, with uh, with uh, Gina Ackley. Uh, Gina, and I want to start with Gina uh, because Gina will give us a kind of real life uh, uh, look at, at what's going on for us small or medium-sized businesses in Barrie. Uh, Gina is the president of Trow and Holden. Uh, it's a stone cutter tool manufacturer in Barrie. Gina, thanks very much. Five minutes. How does these healthcare issues impact you? Okay, I brought handouts. <laughs> <laughs> it's a woman that gets to the point, right? <laughs> well, because the numbers, you guys know, you do these numbers all the time, but they're hard to just talk about without actually seeing them in front of your face. So about uh, last this year, we switched from an industry self-funded plan to Blue Cross Blue Shield. The industry <coughs> self-funded plan that we had used to be fantastic until they started soliciting new members. And then over the period of three years, my premiums increased 56%. Say that again. Last three years? Three years increased 56%. And that's on a self-funded plan. It was a Cadillac plan. $200 deductible, $600 out of pocket. It was okay. awesome. But my premiums, I used to, they gave me a premium holiday when I started. They gave me money back and then they increased up to 56% because of the increased usage from this population that they solicited. So we go to Blue Cross Blue Shield. I can only choose your best plans because I'm coming from a Cadillac plan and I have to have a stack deductible. Even your platinum plan was saving me money. Um, and I broke it down 
one of the most meaningful ways I can break this down is the per hour cost to me as an employer of the different levels of health care plan that I provide. So if you're on a platinum family plan for my company, it is the equivalent of me paying you an additional $14 an hour for the year. Um, so, so it goes without saying, Gina, you want to pay your workers decent wages. Absolutely. But now this is 14 bucks an hour just on health care. Exactly. Without any increase. If you increase it, it goes up to sixteen eighty-two. Um, I pay people a tremendous amount of money to not take my health care. So I only actually have six out of 16 employees on my plan because I pay you 28% of the premium I would pay to take somebody else's health care plan. Uh, that comes out to anywhere between six and $900 a month, which is additional salary to you just for being somewhere else. I don't know what kind of plans they have. They're probably not great. Um, but with that in mind, my health care cost between premiums and my buyout this year are going to be around $200,000. Um, with the, uh, if all of my employees were covered, if everybody took it, my health care costs this year it would be $430,000. With a 19% increase next year, if all of my employees took it, my health care costs would be half a million dollars. I'm a $3 million a year company. So that, yeah, right? So it's a, it's a pretty significant amount of money um, for me to be spending on health care. And that's because I have to give people the best plan for a few different reasons. I'm a union shop, so it's negotiated into my contract. I can't come out and say, you can have, I'll get, I'll pay for one person on a bronze plan, good luck. A, that would be completely unethical, because the bronze plans, as I'm sure you know, you're still paying for them, and you're, what, looking at a $6,400 deductible, $9,400 out of pocket per person. Most people don't have that amount of cash in a savings account to cover it. If anything happens, never mind if the worst happens. So I have to offer my employees the highest level of health care that I can because they expect it and because they deserve it. But the costs are prohibitive. And because I'm a union shop, I don't have any real negotiating power in terms of, of taking my costs down. And you also want to buy right? people's Absolutely. good health care. I mean, I need health care. I, I have a pre-existing condition. I can't survive without excellent health care. Um, and I've got people with families and people with young kids. Okay. Um, okay, Gina, thanks very much. Yep. Uh, let me go to Owen. Owen Foster is the chair of the Green Mountain uh, Care Board, which does um, oversight for the hospitals in, in the state of Vermont. So, Owen, thanks for being with us. Can you give us an overview of what's going on in Vermont? Our health care costs are rising faster than nearly anywhere in the country. Our per capita health care spend has risen the most in the nation in the last 30 years. Meanwhile, access is down and health outcomes have not improved. They've been largely stagnant. So we're spending more and more and asking Vermonters to pay more, and we're not seeing the outcomes we want from that investment. Um, to Gina's point, a silver plan in 2018 cost $31,000, including the max out of pocket for a family of four. Now it's $52,000. That's more than a nice Tesla every single year that a family is buying. Hospital costs have risen dramatically. Hospitals make up 47% of our healthcare spending in the state, and UVM is 61% of that. Despite incredible financial support from Vermonters, eight out of 14 hospitals last year have negative operating margins. And I appreciate Senator Sanders and his staff putting this together because the urgency is real. We are going to see incredible financial stress in the healthcare system if you don't already. The math does not work. We have a dwindling commercial market and incredible financial need. If we don't change dramatically, and Vermonters are already experiencing all right, let me ask you, Owen, if you uh, took less time than I gave you. So now I hope you get what's going on faster than Mark and other things. Multiple reasons. A lot of people will point to an aging demographic. However, we have the cheapest, lowest Medicare per spending cost in the country. Last, 51st. We're one of the most expensive healthcare states in the country, but our Medicare spending is the lowest in the nation. So it is not because we're an aging population. That is a contributor, but it's not the cause. We have 14 hospitals with incredible financial needs to sustain themselves. Solvency is a real issue. It costs a lot to keep that going. So we have a choice now to sustain the hospitals as currently configured and experience continual 10 to 20% rate increases for businesses like Genos. That's what it will take to maintain hospitals as we currently have them. 
Pharmaceutical costs is another thing that people often point to. Pharmaceutical cost spending in Vermont on a per capita basis is far below national. We actually don't spend a lot on pharmaceutical costs as compared to national. It's atrociously inappropriate nationally, but in Vermont on a comparative basis, we do better. And the other culprit is often um, insurance companies. Our insurance companies are not on solid financial ground. So Vermonters are spending a ton, and our insurance companies, our local nonprofits, are not on solid financial footing, and neither are the hospitals. If you look at community providers and others, they're not on solid financial ground either. So we have a system problem. There's no more money to bail out these problems. Gina's business can't take it. My family's business can't take it. We can't take it. We have to allocate our resources better. Okay. Uh, I want to thanks very much. Uh, Don George is the president of Blue Cross Blue Shield in the state. Uh, Don, you are, as I mentioned earlier, are proposing rate increases of 16.3% for individual plans, 19% for small group plans. Why? Well, Senator, I um, want to address this in the context of essentially one third of the Vermont population, 200,000 members that are insured by Blue Cross Blue Shield in Vermont. I have lived and worked in Vermont all my life. Um, as many of you know, I have a very native Tron Holden, as I said to Ginny at Beyonce, is an iconic Berry brand, if not Vermont brand, since 1890. And I applaud your call to action today. We have to make sure that they are there for another 75 years. And it's not going to be unless we can get a grip on health care spending in, in Vermont. I, I agree with Owen and everything you said about what way ahead in our trends for the country. I want to address with you all what I see is a very alarming trend in the healthcare cost escalation in Vermont, and it's not going to be specific prescription drug trend costs and manufacturer prices. So that is a troublesome and difficult issue. Forty-seven percent of our premiums flow through hospitals, but it's not specific to the hospital costs in the state. The alarming trend that I want to address for all of us is a trend in the deterioration of the health status among the 200,000 Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont members, which is causing an increase in the proliferation and use of prescription drugs, an increase in use of medical services, and certainly an increase in use in the more intensive healthcare services. So how do I come by this determination about a deterioration in health status or is that the root cause of what's driving a escalation in Vermont? It is that you all know we have a wealth of claim information and diagnostic information for everyone's claims that we adjudicate at Blue Cross Blue Shield. And using the ACG category group, where we're able to identify every one of those 200,000 people as either being in a healthy status, a chronic and episode status of care, which is more expensive than heaven forbid, a complex and catastrophic claim status. If I go to 2020, more than half of those members were in a healthy status and their cost to the delivery system and their consumption of healthcare services is about $2,000 per year. Little less than half, or about 40%, were in a catastrophic or some sort of episodic care need, and their costs are four times more. They're costing $8,000 per year. And then, less than 10%, 9% of us as Vermonters are in need of some form of catastrophic or complex care in which they will be in UBMMC in the hospital in each place. And those folks cost $34,000 per year. Just fast forward just two years to 2022. And the number of people that are healthy, which was greater than 50%, has decreased to 43%. So where are they going? They're migrating to having one or more chronic illnesses. So the number and percentage of people in Vermont now that have a chronic illness has increased from less than 40 to nearly 45%. And then the most stunning thing for me, the deterioration of the health of Vermonters is that of these 200,000 people, where 9% of them had a complex condition, that has increased to 13%. And when I weighed out the relative differential and in the increase in cost of this deterioration of people progressing from healthy to chronic, and then from chronic to complex, the cost is $235 million more that is being put on the Vermont healthcare system to care for relatively the same population. And then consider one more thing about the proliferation of prescription drugs and our dependence on manufacturers that just charge whatever they want, whatever they feel the market can bear without impunity. And that is, of these 200,000 people, there were 6% of them 
over a one-year period from 2022 to 2023 that began to become first-time users of some form of prescription drug regimen. It costs about $2,100 on average per year for any of us that are on prescription drugs. When you add 6% or more than 10,000 more people in a given year, that's driving $25 million more in the system. So when I see this, it's more than $250,000 over a two-year period being added to the system. And the increasing healthcare needs of people in that progression, it begins to point to us why we have a mental health and primary care system and those providers under such stress and state of mind. And why we're driving increases in healthcare costs and why we have double digit premium increases. There are some good points that I want to be discussing. Um, let's go to Jeff. Let's talk about the healthcare. Let's go to Steve. We're feeling what you're all talking about. So first thing I want to tell you is that the medical center is busier than it's ever been. We did more surgeries. We're going to do more surgeries in the month of May than we've ever done in a single month before. And we're still building up a backlog. We're doing as many cases as we can. The hospital is completely full every single day with people waiting across the state. Come to us. Some of the things that you described, Senator Sanders, like spending $125 million for travelers, we need to do that to care for sick people during the pandemic. While the number was outrageous, I'm proud that we did it when we had to because that's how we took care of people during that time. We would like to not be spending $75 million right now on travelers, but if we did, we'd have to turn away a lot more Vermonters. Vermonters wouldn't be able to get care. The alternative, no one is talking about turning away Vermonters. People are talking about cost-effective health care. Is there an alternative to having probably emergency that two or three times will open up? We have many projects that we're doing right now to increase the number of work nurses that can look at the medical center. We have partnerships with UVM College Nursing. We have partnerships with the state colleges. We have pathways so that people that are working at the hospital can become licensed assistants, ultimately RNs, and we're paying for that. It's going to take time, but we are strongly supportive of having Vermonters have the opportunity to grow and um, have other good jobs. 60% of our budget every year is wages, and there's tremendous pressure on wages right now. Um, we have a shortage of many different health care workers. We have a shortage of nurses, respiratory therapists, radiology technicians, they go on and on, and um, they are able to draw high wages, and we have to compete and pay that. And so our wage pressure is going up every year to collect the budget that we need to make sure that we have all of our beds open. When um, you hear about utilization, we're seeing that. I just saw some data this week that the greatest number of Vermonters right now is in the ages of 59 to 64. I think there's, I'll say 40,000, maybe I'm not wrong, but the most Vermonters right now are 59 to 64. 59 to 64 year olds mostly have commercial insurance. And at that age, you start using a lot more. We need more younger Vermonters who need less health care, not on meds, don't have chronic illnesses. We're seeing and feeling that every day. Our, screen, our demand for screening exams has gone way up. Vermont is aging, and while I agree with Owen that we are a very low-cost Medicare state, Medicaid right now doesn't even cover close to cost of care on anything. And the inflationary pressures that we feel for labor, for drugs, for supplies, when Medicaid doesn't cover that part, for many years we've shifted that to commercial. It's getting harder to do that now because commercial is hitting up against the wall. How is that inflationary pressure covered? So we want to be here for everybody. We don't want to lose any services. We want to make sure we can supply that. Um, right now, it's expensive to have the staff to do it. It's expensive to have the medications to provide. Um, we do have new medications coming online that cost a million dollars for a course of treatment. They provide miracles to people, um, but it is very expensive to do that. Um, okay, uh, we discussed a little bit about primary uh, health care. Jeff McKee is the CEO of the Community Health Center in Burlington. That's the largest community health center in the state. Um, uh, Jeff, from your perspective, what does this crisis look like? How do we go forward? Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, we are 
to be back up. So we've been in some level of conversation about healthcare reform with many of the people in this room for more than a decade. And the, the place we always go in each of those conversations is we need to move uh, care upstream, primary care, out of the hospital. At the same time, we haven't really made tremendous progress in doing it. And we have all this attention on the hospital spend in it, as it should be, I suppose, because that is the biggest bolus of dollars. But in the meantime, I think we've been neglecting primary care. Non-hospital primary care is in a crisis. We have uh, increasingly our federally qualified, qualified health centers across the state are having uh, negative budget variances as well, or negative, uh, are losing money. Uh, community health centers, we lost 1.3 million two years ago. Last year that we just closed, we lost, I think, uh, we closed the books finally, but it's going to be about a half a million dollars. We're trying desperately to close that gap. Um, our premiums that we pay, we're in this interesting place that, you know, we, we pay our premiums and we're a provider. Uh, the premiums we pay have, uh, over the last three years, total 40%. Um, uh, increase 40 percent for, uh, for your own employees. employees. For our own employees, yep. How many employees? We have about 340. Um, in the meantime, uh, we've been you know advocating, you know, certainly on Medicare rates. We appreciate the, the senator's Tyler's advocacy there. Medicaid has been somewhat responsive recently, but pleased with that. Commercial insurers across that same span of time, a net functional increase of two percent in our rates across that same three-year period. Um, that includes a, a significant cut in one of those years, and then we're basically coming back to the restoration of the cut in our rates. That's a recipe that doesn't work for any business, let alone a nonprofit who pours everything back into the community. And um, and I want to say that you know the, the dollars for us and the losses, we're big enough, we have a balance sheet, and we can sustain that. Some of the upcoming cities in the state are not. And we're all feeling that at this point. And even our time is limited if we don't change something. And that means a couple of things for us that are really important to I think everybody. One is that we can't pay enough to our staff to recruit and retain them. And that's not just about the staff, although it is that. It's also about access to care. If I don't have primary care providers in the office, if I can't get them to come to Vermont because our housing costs are so high and they, they, they can make more money and do easier work someplace else, then it's a health access issue and ultimately, in my opinion, a health equity issue. The federally qualified health center's demographic is different in the demographic served by many other healthcare institutions. We go places and serve people that no other healthcare institution does. That mission for all of us is at risk if we don't have that access available. So people of color uh, who have been uh, uh, kind of disenfranchised from the healthcare system, um, refugees, immigrants, um, people who are unhoused, uh, people with substance use disorder, mental health disorders, who we go to them as much as possible to provide that care, um, are losing out on that access when the federal qualified health centers are support our Jeff, I think it would not surprise you, I suspect you know everything. As a nation, we spend maybe 5 to 7% of our huge healthcare budget on primary care. Most other countries spend double that. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, their cost of healthcare, they keep their people healthier, and they keep their people, uh, they do it in a more cost effective mm -hmm. way. All right, let me, all uh, right, all right, well, I want to get back to that issue. It's something we've been working very hard on in DC. But uh, let me last but not least talk about Dr. Mark Levine. Uh, and, Doc, uh, and Mark has, I'm sure, dealt with all of these issues and many more. Uh, Mark, I want to just ask you your sense about the cost of healthcare and Vermont's impact on people and what we can do to improve the situation. You know, it's great that I'm coming last because I'm synthesizing what I'm hearing, and there are so many disconnects, and I just will put them on the table. Um, we heard from Owen about uh, a lot of statistics about what's going on in healthcare in Vermont. Turns out, any year you look at for the last several years, uh, any organization that does the health rankings of the states, Vermont is always in the top five. So much of this is a national problem that in our small world in Vermont mm -hmm. is very dramatic for us, but it is everywhere. But we rank very high in health. But it speaks to a national broken system. It speaks yes. to a broken system. 
if we look at um, our state health assessment, which we do every five years, we're doing it right now. We ask monitors, we ask partners across communities, we ask disenfranchised groups from a health equity standpoint, we ask public health officials, what, what's the big problems? And uniformly and unanimously, they talk about mental health and substance use, the housing crisis, access to care, and uh, the cost of living. Um, real problems that everyone's dealing with. And the other disconnect, access to care. If you look at any national uh, uh, assessment of who gets good care in America, Vermont is up there at the top for access to primary care. Yet here we are telling you, everyone, that it's a problem. Yet we are the best. So you can imagine if you live in... Let me interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. Well, me and my family, I want to call up... Uh, what's a skin doctor called? A Dermatologist. Dermatologist. Right. Took me months to get an appointment. Yes. That's, I mean, you know... That's not primary care. care. That's, so, not primary. that's not primary care. No, so you could... My son wanted to check up that came once. I mean, yeah. am I telling any secrets here? No. No, no. no I'm, I'm pointing You're out. You're the most accessible. How long? I want to go to a physical. How long is it going to take me to get it? Um, yeah, probably uh, two months. Several months. months. They want dental care? Yeah. How, long, how long is it going to take? Uh, interesting. I get you a dentist fairly quickly. <laughs> Getting into a hygienist for a cleaning, probably six months or eight months. Right. So, I didn't mean to. No, no. But this is the disconnects I want to point out. We are ranked at the top for health, but we're hearing how unhealthy we are. We are ranked at the top for access to primary care, but that only goes so far in terms of when will you have that access, and if you lose it, how do you replace it? Because it's a very constant work. My former life, as many know, uh, I was an associate dean for graduate medical education. We have a crisis in students not choosing primary care careers. Oh. There are some very compelling reasons for that, some of which are economic, unfortunately. Um, and when there are several hundred thousand dollars you can tell debt, me if I'm an orthopedic surgeon versus a primary care physician, what's the discrepancy? Exactly. What is it? Million yeah. Per year? Yeah, it's probably three to four hundred thousand right. per, per year. Career? Mm -hmm. Per career? Per career, it's millions. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. So we yes. don't have enough, I gather we have enough orthopedic surgeons? We're recruiting right now, but we're better than primary care. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but the difference is everything being built primary care doctor works different schedules, exactly. has a tough job in many respects, and makes maybe half of what a orthopedic surgeon makes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say so nowadays. It used to be worse, it's better mm -hmm. uh, because part of recruitment is primary care can get paid a little better than it did in the past in some places. In some places. Um, we talk about in public health determinants of health. Um, the lowest amount of percent that is a determinant of health is health care. People aren't unhealthy because they're not getting the health care necessarily. They're unhealthy because of the socioeconomic and environmental factors at play and lifestyle behavior changes. Mm -hmm. Which brings me, I hate to integrate the pandemic into this, but I will just briefly integrate it. Because Don's statistics from 2020 to several years ago are very relevant. The pandemic has left everyone, and Vermont included, in a very different state than they were before. And the sequela to the pandemic has been the crisis in homelessness, a crisis in mental health and substance use, a crisis of what I call uh, health debt, meaning people had better lifestyle habits but then when it was stay home, stay safe, uh, adopted worse habits, and they've had trouble climbing out of that, getting back to the previous habits. And their chronic diseases either were then exposed or highly exacerbated, often ignored because they falsely felt that the healthcare system was the least safe place to be during the pandemic, and in fact, it, we proved that wrong completely. So now, what's in the emergency room? It's not COVID, it's not flu. It's chronic disease being exacerbated and being at much more complex levels than it ever has been before. Uh, and when you accompany students and residents to their patients to see what's, what's, what are you taking care of in the hospital? 
every single person there is way more complex than they were five years ago or 10 years ago. And Steve can attest to that. And being more complex is another euphemism for costing a lot more mm -hmm. because of their complexity. So we are much harder to discharge. I want to interrupt you, but so yes. that complexity makes it very hard for the nursing homes to take them. And that's the nursing right. homes get a set day rate. And if these people are on expensive medications, the nursing home can't afford to take them. If they need to have a sitter or some kind of observer, the nursing home can't take them. If they require an extra person to help move them, the nursing home can't afford to take them. So that means that today we have more than 50 people waiting for nursing home discharge. And, 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 the, right now. and, and the academic medical center is overweighted with those compared to some of our other hospitals. But the other hospitals have some of those patients too, which is why the state has tried to develop a relationship with another firm that specializes in the complex people who hospitals can't discharge. Uh, we're hoping to open that sometime in the near future, but it's not tomorrow. All right, I think it's been a good discussion. So the, the primary care wait times, I couldn't get a primary care provider. When I became the chair of the care board, I tried to get a primary care provider. I called eight places. At best, I got on the wait list. And finally, I had an urgent thing. I got a cancellation done, but I couldn't get one. And I tried for years. So the primary care access is not. It may be compared to national, which is poor, right. but our primary care spend is actually rather poor in the state. All right. Oh, and then, can I finish one sure, other thing? Because you mentioned the percentage of our country spends on primary care. Do you know the percentage it spends on public health? It's not a quiz. It's, it's, two, it's two to three percent at best. Oh, on public health. On yeah. public yeah. health. If you go to any of the Scandinavian countries that you brought here to, to visit, um, other developed nations, even in a country of Costa Rica, which Atolga Wandi wrote about not too long ago, uh, public health is in the teens percent of what their health systems yeah, Most uh, other countries do. figure out that it's more important to keep people healthy. Right. And, and their outcomes. And the fortune right. and the hospital. And their outcomes are no matter what you look at, whether yes. it's the ultimate outcome of death, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, childhood or maternal morbidity or mortality statistics, you can name it, chronic diseases, they're all better. Mm -hmm. uh, so Let's we, have, back to the we have a fundamental place. issue. We have a fundamental issue. Um, and it is beyond belief that we spend twice as much on healthcare and live far shorter lives than we have on other countries. Yeah. Blew me away, I don't know if you also saw this article in Washington Post. Portugal, poor country, their life expectancy is, I think they spend 20%, they don't spend any kind of it, 20% of what we spend, their life expectancy is. Well, I yesterday was on the phone with the woman who's done a very good job, head of the uh, Vermont uh, School Nurses Association. So, I mean, Throwing on top of all the other problems we've discussed, we have a problem of obesity in America, right? Which leads to diabetes, right? Yeah. Which is going to cost us hundreds of billions of dollars to treat and all other, a lot of other illnesses. So I ask, what are we doing? What are the schools doing? Do we have programs designed to deal with uh, kids overweight? And I'm not so sure that we do. I mean, getting back to prevention. I know we do a good job. We've had some success with smoking, right? Yeah, we've got. Um, we we no. haven't had funding for childhood obesity mm -hmm. since 2017. The CDC gets to fund about 15 states a year for obesity in general, uh, and we don't qualify because we're one of the less obese states. Even though I think we'd all agree we still have a problem. Here. Uh, Costa Rica, by the way, the average income is one sixth of our country. The average probably. healthcare cost is a minuscule fraction of our country, but they live to 81. We live now to 76, 77. All right, so we're in agreement that the current system is dysfunctional and broken and wisdom. Uh, and we are in agreement this is the national, all of these things we're talking about probably yeah. take place in every state in the country, it's not just No, I think in many ways we do a better job even our people are more serious. We don't have yeah. for-profit hospitals, right, uh, et cetera. All right, given all of that, what, I'm, what I want to ask of you, and I want to repeat, uh, you're all knowledgeable, you do hard work. I just do not feel that there's a sense of urgency. Uh, who can remind me? Um, uh, where's Kate? Katie? How many nurses do we need in the next six 
5,400 in the next two years. 5,400 nurses, and that's all the nurses are retiring. Where is the plan? Mm -hmm. Are you with the state here? You got a plan to give us 5,400 nurses the next two years? I'm not single-handedly, <laughs> but we have a lot going on. I mean, yeah, but I keep but, hearing, look, yeah. I'm in the Senate, I hear a lot of words. Right. A lot going on. Right. That's a lot of phraseology. Yeah. Exactly how are you going to get us 50? I don't mean to point to you. I no, of course. Right. It, it's all of our But we work actually in, in concert with incentivization programs. Right. Steve mentioned some programs. programs. We add them all together, Steve. Ain't going to be 5,400 in two years. No. That I can assure you. Not a chance. All right. So, you know, you and I have discussed this kind of a passion of mine. We're spending money on the nurse, the traveling nurses, but we're not investing in getting our young people to be nurses, educating them, et cetera. What are you going to do about it? Why is he wasting money? And I don't, I hear his refrain is we have to take care of our patients. Of course you do. No one's arguing that. But you can take care of your patients with well paid local nurses who earn half as much as traveling nurses, right? Yes. So what are you doing? Where's the plan? Somebody has a three year plan to give us, what, 7,000? 5,400 nurses. Where's the plan? Don, you got that plan? I don't have that plan, and, and I'm going to. I actually would say that I think we need to take this to a higher level. I think the connection between what Dr. Lee talked about and what I talked about yeah. is we need, Senator, we need comprehensive health care system no reform. Kidding. All right, I only been fighting for that 30 years. And I don't get, you know, and Blue Cross Blue Shield is as much a part of the problem as anybody else. You're an insurance company, right? Yep. All right. Insurance companies and you're a nonprofit, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But your colleagues there are making huge sums of money. I suspect you don't make $20 million a year, right? Uh, no. You know, but some of your fellow CEOs of insurance companies, yes? Make uh, 20, 30 million? At the United Signet, yes. Okay, all right. Yeah. It's a broken and corrupt system. All right, what I'm asking you is I can't solve it here. I am trying, actually, in Washington. Okay, and I'm not one of the most beloved guys from the drug companies or the insurance companies. What can we do here in Vermont? So, I'll start. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that we have clinical space for every single student who wants to go to one of our colleges and become a nurse. We don't have enough clinical opportunities okay. right now. At the medical center, there's only so many people we can send into one person's room that are learners. Okay, stop. No. So you don't have the physical space to educate the number of nurses you need, right? Yeah, I would say we don't have enough patients, patients. in rooms. So at the medical center, we have 500 beds. And we, there's a certain amount of learners you can have on any one floor any day that still allows good care to happen. You can't send 10 nurse, new nurses right. into one room. There's a limit, right? So we are maxed out. We're full. I think we have about 2,100 learners a year that come through the medical center. Learning what? Uh, Everything. Students? Residents, nursing yeah. students, yeah. respiratory okay. students. Okay. And we really believe that's about as many okay. as we can have okay. and provide high quality care. Okay. We need every hospital in the state to be able to take some learners and as you know, that's something that we have worked on. We have yeah. quadruple funding for teaching health centers, which means that Rutland uh, and Southwestern and others will now be able to have residents. Yes. Does that make sense to you? Yes, absolutely. Okay. We have to be able to, so we need to train every single person in Vermont who wants to be a nurse and have an opportunity for them to go to nursing school, which we don't right now. Number two. I, you don't have, you mentioned you have the space issue. Okay. Number two is enough clinical educators. Right. What are you doing about that? So we have worked on a program at UVM to make sure that we have a stronger program to let more people be both educators and clinical nurses. It's a good program, but it is limited in terms of the nurse. It's not as big it's as it could be. It's a sensible program. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you're moving people up the ladder. Next, every person that comes to work at the medical center has an opportunity from where you start to progress to other jobs okay. that we need. So we're hiring people right now that are EDS workers that are gonna be going to respiratory therapy school. Good. We're paying them full-time wages to go to school. And when they can graduate from respiratory therapy school, they'll work for us three years. We're training people to be, get their LMA license. You helped us with that last year, thank you. Then they can go on to get Let their- Let me give you an example. All right. This is the you insanity, know, and, and uh, Katie knows more about it than I do. Explain the problem. This is the system that we have explained. You know, you familiar with the problem? The LMA. What, what was the problem that existed that we resolved? So the LNA problem was that we had many, many people. We have a desperate need for LAs, right? They were going LAs. to school and they couldn't take the certification test. Why couldn't they take the certification test? Because the state didn't have capacity to 
give everyone the test in a timely fashion, right? Katie, what was the story? Yeah. So it's essentially the issue was, and, and yeah. you know, Steve, credit to you and yeah. your team for bringing this to us, was that there was an issue with the testing yes. facilities and the testing company that the state was contracting with to use and getting permission from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to allow the school where these LNAs were being educated to provide the tests. Or for us to be able to do it. Or for you to be able to do it, so either in their employment yeah. setting or in their school setting. Um, all that was needed was essentially a stamp of approval by CMS to say, yes, you can do this, it's not a conflict of interest, um, to either do it in the place of education or the place of employment. And so that was an issue yeah. you brought to us um, yeah. You, we talked to CMS, and I think a month after we talked to CMS, they gave us the green light to move forward with the plan. Really helped us. Mm -hmm. But it's a little, uh, that's what a phone call can do. All right. Mm -hmm. yep. So we have a program where you can come, be hired as an LNA, and actually get full wages, all of it to become an RN, get full time wages to go to school and become a nurse. We have to make sure that we're offering competitive wages to recruit people here, and Vermont has a housing crisis as a child care crisis. We have a lot of travelers that are working there now that would love to stay in Vermont but can't afford a house. Um, our recruitment is going okay. And then lastly, and I would say most importantly, retention. We really want people to come, move to Vermont, get a job, and then stay there for their careers. Um, our retention is improving um, much better than during the pandemic in the last year. We've had about 6% turnover. That's well below national average at the medical center. But we have to hold on to everybody. We have to basically, if you come and you're confident, we have to make sure that we figure out ways that people are able to stay for their careers. All, right. All of which is good. And I'm, you know, I don't mean to be hot in I know you're trying. But I think any, and again, uh, we are dealing with national issues, and you all should know. We have proposed legislation, fought for legislation, which would address many of these issues. Um, but, um, Mark, I still, somebody has got to take responsibility. I mean, Steve has talked about what the medical center is trying to do. Somebody has got to say that it's crazy for him to have to waste money on traveling nurses when we can have homegrown nurses and that we need a three-year plan to do it. He's doing some of the things, but it's not enough. Who has, who takes the responsibility for saying that in three years we're going to address this problem, he won't have to hire? And it's not just you. I mean, Rutland hired a lot of traveling nurses, correct? Yes, every hospital in the state is using traveling nurses. You right should now. also re realize the entire long-term care sector is hiring traveling nurses. Okay. The substance abuse treatment sector is. All right. So well, it, well, it, well, it is an epidemic. You're adding to my point. Right. What are you doing about it? Right. Now, I know, I know this is not necessarily in your portfolio, but, yeah, no, but, but is there a yeah. plan to say that in three years, five years, we'll have resolved this problem? Steve told us what we have got to do. Mm -hmm. We need more nurse educators. We need to figure out a way to get them right. the, the students into places where they can be helpful. Mm -hmm. right? It's a solvable problem, is it not? I believe it's a solvable problem, yes. Yeah, Mrs. Don, yeah. you know. Yeah. Who is, on a, who is saying, are you doing anything about this, Don? Well, I, Senator, I, if you give me a moment, I would say, I, I think that we need, every system is perfectly designed for the outcome it's getting. In the nation and in Vermont, our healthcare system is perfectly designed for the outcome that we are so distraught over here today. And I, I would begin with, there's, there's two things here. There are things like travel and nurses that we should have a discrete plan on, I should begin to work on immediately. I'll, I'll leave that to Mark and to Steve, but what Blue Cross of Vermont wants to endorse is where we started with the ACA passing in the federal government and Act 48 in Vermont a dozen years ago, a commitment to comprehensive health care system reform in which we don't just incrementally change from the outside of the system. We go right to the heart of it and we disrupt the system and create one that actually is going to get the outcomes that Tron Holden and Gina and other Vermonters need and deserve. And that begins by making sure we're covering everybody and then we change the way we pay for health care. And paying for health care differently is substantial in which we pay for primary prevention and pay Steve to manage a global population, sure. but it's not enough. We need to have change the way we provide care to those people that are catastrophically ill and have chronic conditions. But the connection I think today is an important one between what I shared is a deteriorating health status of Blue Cross Vermont members 
and, and Dr. Levine's perspective on this having been an outcome of the pandemic, which I also endorse, is that we need to come at this from both angles. We need to change the way we deliver care to those people at real, but we need to engage in primary prevention and invest in it in the way that Dr. Lee and talked to. And it's always the most overlooked aspect of, of, um, of healthcare reform. So we need to come at this from both angles. And as soon as we get going on engaging the stakeholders, the people that are here today, and beginning that hard work, then we'll be able to do it. In the near term, we are going to need regulation to constrain the current system while we change it and to solve issues like um, the, the traveling nurses. Owen, how are we going to, is there a sense of urgency to deal with these problems? Do you detect that? I, I do not detect a sense of urgency that's needed. Um, on the nursing, in terms of uh, primary care, I want to cite two things. One, the governor recently passed a uh, bill eliminating prior authorization for primary care providers. That will make Vermont a more attractive state to come and practice primary care. In. Second, the care board has really honed in on the problems of primary care. One of the things we're doing is making sure that the allocations from insurance companies to pay primary care providers is sufficient, right? So historically, we've seen hospital rate increases dwarf what Jeff's getting, right? That limits primary care and makes it harder for primary care to be there, which then results in acuity and backup. So we have to support primary care, and we're taking steps to do that as a state. Um, the other one... Uh, are we really doing... We're taking baby steps, it sounds like we want. I would say the baby steps. Um, we also have the aging demographic that will hurt Steve's effort to retain nurses. They're aging. And with the primary care providers, they're aging. So it's not just retaining them. We need more and far younger. Uh, and as a nation, medical schools are not graduating anywhere near the number of doctors that we need. Correct. And you don't have any housing, and you don't have any child care, and you're voting down school budgets all over the state, and you're making it almost you're making it almost impossible to move here if not stay here as the demographic that you want, which is my demographic, which is people in their mid-30s and mid-40s with children who want to be somewhere stable and invested. And it just gets harder and harder. Right, Gina, what did you get out of all of this discussion? I think you guys fixed it. <laughs> 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 I mean, look, I looked up how much all of you make before I got here. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, and I make, I pay myself $86,000 a year, and I feel guilty because my dad never paid himself more than seventy-five. <laughs> um, you know, and and everybody deserves to make money, and I don't mean to denigrate that, but it's very hard for me to look at some of those numbers and look at some of those profit numbers and say there's not enough money in the system and that we have to keep sucking more money out of the bottom of the system. And that seems to be how most systems are designed in this country, that the, we're going to continue to make it harder and harder for people. I mean, I have an MBA and I own a company. You know, I shouldn't be broke, but I am. And if anything changed in my life dramatically, I would, I would struggle immediately to get back on my feet. Um, and so I think that while you're thinking about all the numbers and the statistics and the data and the, and the people and the aging populations, you know, that, that in some ways for me it feels like there's just a practical element here. Like we don't need to keep padding the top levels at the expense all right, of the people Steve, who are let me ask you a hard system. question. <laughs> Do you really need 10 people at the medical center to make a half a million dollars? What I would say is I hear you and I understand, um, and the medical center tries to pay every single person from the EDS worker that we hire to our CEO competitive wages so we can attract. We're in the nursing negotiations right now, and we're working very hard to come up with a contract that pays on market rates. And we try to do that at every level, and you and I have had this conversation a number of times. Yes, we at what level should we stop paying com market rates? Should we stop at at above nurses, don't pay the doctors competitive rates. Should we stop at a certain number at 200,000? We no longer pay competitive rates. If we're gonna be able to compete with other places to re attract people to come do this work, um, we, we, I think we have to pay competitive. It's very hard to figure out where we'd stop doing that. I, well said, but I disagree with you. Fair. From the regulatory perspective, one of the things we look at with all hospitals is how much money is being spent on administrative costs. You know, I looked at one hospital's staffing summary from their budget, the number of managers went from 471 in fiscal year 21 to 583 in fiscal year 24. The amount of money dedicated to paying nurses went from 25% of staff salaries down to 24% in fiscal year 24 budget. What we want to see as a regulator is more money being dedicated to patient care. 
not management. Management can be a beneficial thing. You're finding ways to provide care more efficiently and more cost effective, great. But that's got to pull through or it needs to change. I mean, Steve has given the party line on this one. All right. In other words, look, if I say uh, I'm going to pay Owen a million dollars a year and then you're hiring Mark, you got to pay him a million. But who determined I have to pay him a million? point that I made in Canada, whose system is probably better run than ours, CEOs get about half as much as we do. And I think there's a culture. I mean, CEOs are very, very important. If you went out in the private sector, you could make even more. But getting back to Gina's point, this is what our country is about. CEOs make 400 times what their workers make. All right? I don't think that's a good idea. It manifests itself in healthcare as well. I would love to see, and I know this is tough, and I know your people work hard, but I would love to see us change the culture. I cannot believe that we cannot attract people who want to provide great quality care to people, who see healthcare and saving lives as their mission in life, maybe don't need, you know, five or six hundred thousand, maybe we can get by a two or three hundred thousand. That's great. But it's a change of culture, and I understand. One more comment. Yeah. So, and once again, I hear you. Um, our budget for 25, if we get through August, is going to be over $2 billion. Okay? The amount that we pay our leaders is a tiny fraction of that. You fired all of us. There was no more leaders. No one to do CONs, no one to put the budget through. It would have you almost... You with the no. politics. You make these arguments very well. You're wrong, but you make them very well. No one suggested that we I'm fire all... i not going into politics. I can guarantee that. All right. um, th th it would make no difference in this conversation. Right. It's a, but it's a culture. Here's what it is. You're right. In terms of the total amount of money, the $2 billion budget, not a lot. But it's a culture. It's a culture that says the people on top are making really large salaries, and therefore, I can do this over here, and you can do this over here, rather than saying, hey, you know what? We're all in this together. We're all going to tighten our belts. And I find it interesting. What does the government make? 190000 a year or something? I make $173,000 a year. I did write a $1.9 trillion bill. A little bit of money, right? Some responsibility. All right? I got to go out to the taxpayers and say, hey, Bernie, you're making it 173000 Possible people don't. All they do is go to Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's going to pay those, or whatever it is. Right? I mean, you know, it's, it's the cost of doing business. But it is interesting. The governor makes 190. Executives here make 600,000. Why? Part of job? I don't think so. If I could just add a comment to the, the impact of the, the wage pressure that Steve alluded to with the non-executive group and how that affects the, the smaller nonprofits. It, it, it's real. So here in, in Burlington, whatever the hospital does becomes the new standard right. for no what we need to do. You're and raising so, and you yes. know, and, and I, so Look, I support, as you well know, I support your nurses' strike, right? Absolutely. All right. So I'm, I'm proud to see that nurses get decently. I think they should. So, but you're saying, though, they have a better capability of paying that makes it harder for you to attract. Every time they have a union negotiation, I cringe and I watch and I'm like, how the heck are we going to keep up? And how am I going to keep my staff? And one of the, the places people leave us and go to most often is the, is the University of Health All right, what are we going to do? Okay, one second. I want to get back to you know, Jeff and, and primary health care. We're all in agreement that we don't do a particularly good job in primary. I mean, if you are, we recently in my broader family had an issue where a kid was really sick, went to UVM, and the Boston miraculous job. Miraculous. We should be very proud of the kind of care that kid got. On the other hand, as someone said, you can't find the primary care doctor to take care of it. I have one now. You got one. Good. So the question is, what are we doing in Vermont? And that brings in the medical school and everybody else. And, and we are trying to deal with this nationally to make a little bit of success. What are we doing to create a situation anybody in Vermont and get the primary care they need in a primary manner. Can now, I, I should tell you that I'm, we're working hard to expand community health mm -hmm. centers. Jim? So, kind of going back to plan design and, and plan costs, what I was struck when I was when went through all the Blue Cross plans, I made a crazy spreadsheet, and what struck me is that you pay a pretty significant, significant amount of money for plans that are pretty bad unless you have access to primary care, where they make up for the fact that their you know, deductibles and out-of-pockets are astronomical, mm -hmm. is that you're only paying $15 per for your primary care, which works if you can get primary care. 
So now you have a system where people are choosing plans, the only plans that they can afford are dependent on them having access to care that they can't get. And when they have, when it becomes emergent and they end up in the ER or a specialist or they have a chronic condition that's been exacerbated because they haven't been to a doctor in five years, now they're hit with a bill for $18,000. And I don't know anybody in my life that can pay a bill for $18,000 without running into serious issues. So. From a consumer standpoint, that, that system doesn't make any sense. You can't, have a, you can't have a coverage system that is dependent on primary care without having the most robust primary care system imaginable. Well, I, I think it's a primary care in Vermont. Um, we are supporting it through programs that we're developing with primary care physicians that are uh, about supporting primary care transformation, enabling primary care physicians uh, to practice and to see patients in the way that they need and want to be able to see them, paying them prospectively in a way that supports that. Making sure that they have an ability to be able to integrate with mental health care providers because that is a connection in Vermont that is critically important in our communities. I would love to see this become the standard. Um, I would love to see us be able to expand it far more rapidly than we are. We're currently with about four major practices in the state, uh, but that is a small uh, population well, of our primary let care let network. A simple question. Mm -hmm. Do we have enough primary care physicians in the state? I think I know the answer, but somebody help me out. So the data that I've seen says we don't have a huge shortage, but they're not distributed well. So um, we have a fair number of primary care doctors, although what Owen said is true, they're getting older and a lot of them are going to age out pretty soon. Um, we're doing a major project right now at the medical center to basically improve primary care access and open up thousands of new slots and kind of gets back to Don's original mm -hmm. comment. We're risk adjusting our panels so that we're going to look at, you know, a patient's not a patient. A, a 30 year old young man takes much less time to be on your panel and it's easier to care for than someone who's 62 and might have three or four chronic conditions. So we're adjusting all our panels, we're adding the ability for people to self-schedule appointments through the electronic medical record, and we're adding virtual visits, and we think that in 25, that will open up a couple thousand new spots. Uh, you said you think we have enough primary care physicians? The number of providers. In the why state. does it take him and me months to get a doctor? Mm -hmm. My mom was looking, is looking for someone for my uncle trying to move him to state, and she's been calling places, and their wait lists are 700 plus, and they're not adding anybody. Mm -hmm. And that's in central Vermont, like what the third uh, most. So I, I, thought I, data, what I thought I saw data that it was relative. We were about on for front. Is that not true? Was that not wrong? It, it's it's somewhere in between these experiences. There's a couple things going on. One is Steve is correct is where they are, so you may have numbers in other places, not in Chittenden County or in central Vermont. The second thing is the number alone of FTE doesn't tell you the stories, how many patients are seeing right. and what their schedules are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a big piece of it. Yeah. We have a number of providers that aren't seeing the volume. Oh, but does patients. anyone disagree with what Gene or Open no. saying no. that it is? I, is it, you're sure. talking, you live in Gary. No. At least around here, it takes forever to get an appointment. You don't disagree with I don't disagree with So how do we have enough doctors if that's the case? I, I'm, just, I'm not sure of the standard that we're using to measure if we have enough primary care physicians. I would say a lot of calls that we have in the Blue Cross from our customer service are about trying to find help with getting an appointment. There are those yeah. delays. I just say I'm not expert in primary care, although we do work very closely with primary care physicians in the state to help them to practice in the way that they would like to. I, one of the things, though, Senator, is that the advance of medical science in the last 30 years has, has been exponential and we really haven't changed the way we support primary care physicians. They are condemned to having to know uh, less and less about more and more. I can't imagine what it's like just in terms of the relationship with my own primary care physician, what it's like to answer all those emails, to stay on top of all of this. And, and I think that, once again, it gets back to this issue of primary prevention. We simply need to support primary care in a way that is different from today and place greater reliance on nurse practitioners as well, too, to support that primary care network. What do you think, Steve, about that? I actually 100% agree that the care model needs to evolve. We're not graduating enough uh, primary care doctors, and what Owen said is an important addition to what I said. We have a lot of older primary care doctors who might not be seeing a full panel size in the state. Hang on. But they're still seeing some. Right. So we if need a model, a team model. primary care physicians, and I talked to medical school, got good medical school, what are they doing? 
Are they expanding their capability for them to graduating primary care Do you know that? I think they're trying to give opportunities for more students to understand what primary care could be. To We're understand trying to what primary care but could be. I mean, that students, mean we have more primary care physicians. Students pick what their field they're going to go to for many reasons. But we need we primary need care yes. physicians. What are we doing to get primary care physicians? You know, if I'm a if I graduate medical school with four hundred thousand dollars in debt, I'm probably not going to be a primary care physician, right? That's true. Okay. So given that reality, given the fact we need We've all said a dozen times. Any disagreement? We need more primary care physicians, more emphasis on primary care. We end up saving lives, ease suffering, saving money. So what are we doing? So, so there are two things that are happening nationally. They're not in Vermont. One is there is an increasing but still small number of medical schools that have no tuition, kind of the European model. Yeah. So if you go to school and you have no debt, right. you can pretty much go out and do what you dreamed of doing and not what you might perceive you have to do. Second thing is that there's um, some momentum now, I think, to developing medical schools that actually have that emphasis. Mm -hmm. So spoke the other kind day. of sign on the dotted line as you enter because that is your career aspiration and the school will support you on that. I gave the graduation speech the University of New England. We're doing just that. Yep. Okay. And so are some of the uh, historically black colleges in Right. They're very strong. So those are things that are happening, and I think we have to put ourselves in this national context. The, yeah, I, the other important thing that Don mentioned, and the, the term is transformation of primary care. I can't tell you as a former primary care physician before I became a health commissioner how many transformations I've been through. There's another one going on as we speak. Uh, but the goal is what we like to call working to the top of your license. So you actually get to do what you went into medicine to yeah, do, right. and you get to interact with the patient, right. not the computer, not the paperwork, not the administration. Uh, what are you doing about that prior authorization that we're making some progress yes, on? Yes, yes. So all of these things will contribute eventually to uh, more incentivization of primary care because it's more uh, gratifying to practice it uh, in the way you had always envisioned. So we shouldn't minimize that. That That is a big part of what hospitals like Steve's is doing right now to try to improve. We have a primary care advisory committee, which Jeff is a part of, and one of the things we constantly hear is the administrative burden. They're up four or five hours after work dealing with whatever the reporting requirements are. So in terms of health care reform, we have to be very cognizant of the burden you're putting on so they can get these incentive program dollars. It burns them out. They hate it. Um, the other thing is we have to respect primary care for what it is, which is one of the most important medical professions. And I don't think we necessarily do as a society or in hospitals. We pay the orthopedic surgeons considerably more. We need to pay the primary care that we respect it for what it is. Can we, what can we do? That's true. Right, that's true nationally. I agree. I think at the end of the day, you know, you don't want to pit one group of physicians yeah. against another. All are doing important work. But essentially, in terms of the pay scale, we're saying to primary care physicians, they're kind of second-class citizens. Are we not? So if I could just build on what Owen said, you know, our, our providers work 10-hour days. Um, and uh, typically they tell me they go home every night and do paperwork between two and four hours almost every day. They work on Saturdays and Sundays. They don't come in on Monday. So, uh, you know, I, I'm thrilled that the, the, the University Health Center uh, is, is doing what it needs to do in primary care, raising salaries, creating efficiencies. It needs to be us involved in this conversation about how we change healthcare and improve it. Because if all you do is improve it, the net gain for, for healthcare providers in our community is not going to be what we need it to be. We're going to continue to attract our folks. Right? So the National Health Service Corps is amazing, right? So if I think there's something there we can build on that supports. Well, triple funding for it. You know, um, and so we really appreciate that. We had three providers in the last six months. As soon as their their um, uh, commitment was up, left to a went to the to the university. So, do you have a decent enough relationship with the? Uh, in truth, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> no, I, I think we really do. We're not coordinated around these issues. I mean, we're not having conversations, just to be honest, about the global kind of community-wide or even statewide kind of system of care around supporting primary care. We're not doing that together. So I would say we're relatively well coordinated around patient care, transfers yes. back and forth. We're well coordinated on discharge and admissions. We're well coordinated on someone moving through the system seamlessly. 
and much less so on bigger issues like electronic medical records, staffing. I, I, I do know that when we finish a contract, I hear from all the other leaders in Chittenden County that um, we've made their jobs more difficult every time. It's, it's a, it is a huge challenge right now for us to retain folks. It is one of the hardest. You're looking down the road if you're a new, a new physician or what practice you're going to go into. And they come and they, they fall in love with our mission. They fall in love with the patients we serve. And then they look at what our docs are doing every day and say, how do I have a family? How do I have a life? And it's not. It's just uh, what can we do? Again, this is exactly the issue. I will bore you with the details of what we're trying to do in Washington. With only a lot of success. Some success, not enough. What can we do in the state of Vermont to address just that? Well, I think it is broadening the conversation so it's not just hospitals. And this is, you know, it's uh, here in Burlington, it's our, our two organizations, but it's across the state repeated the particular relationship between hospitals and health centers and other non hospital primary what do we do? You know, I think it's really challenging for the major medical center, a major employer of all kinds of clinicians for, for our community health center. Um, to independently solve the problems. Uh, they are healthcare reform level problems that require big system overhauls, as Don was pointing out. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we've, been, we, we've been in a state where we had a former governor whose goal was single payer system and transform care in Vermont, and it fell apart. Uh, Vermont could not do it by itself in a big country uh, as we are. Then we have a newer system that is very accountable care organization uh, dedicated. Um, now we're talking project ahead, which you're familiar with, I'm sure, that uh, is sort of a latest advance that brings in hospital governance and hospital budgeting, but supporting primary care in unique ways and different ways. Um, all of this begins with, I think, what Don Berwick started with, which was the triple aim. And the triple aim is just three things. It's reduce healthcare costs, which of course everyone sees as the biggest, biggest issue. Number two is really more delivery system reform, keeping customer satisfaction high, quality of care high. And then the third one, which everyone goes, what's that? Is actually population health. And population health is, can be practiced at the hospital or primary care or network level. Uh, where we actually try to improve the health of that population. But it really also means on a bigger geographic scale, a regional scale, um, which is really the improvement in funding of public health and prevention efforts that will actually succeed in keeping this complexly ill population healthier so we don't have to have those expenses. And that is the, the ultimate vision, but no one person at this table, like runs that vision and can orchestrate, you know, conduct the orchestra for That's all of it. Because we don't have a system. We need a, a fundamental blowing up of what the system is, uh, which, you know, again, we, as you pointed out, we stand as outliers in the world, whether we're talking about the most developed nations or not. So, yes, all of that, and, <laughs> and I think we, we have a problem you know, yesterday, right? The, the problem is not in the future, the problem is next. Yes. And so, you know, I think there are things that we can do around rates, and that's to ensure that non-hospital primary care has the reimbursement to compete at the same level for staffing as the hospitals. That's an absolute has to be, and it's not there. Um, so, so I agree with that. I mean, as somebody who decides hospital budgets, I am alarmed that the primary care gets 1% or 2% or 0%, and... I don't have a problem with the hospitals having financial needs, but if they get 10% and he gets zero, he's going to have a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's going to hurt population health in mm -hmm. Vermont. Mm -hmm. I, it strikes me that when there's a problem, and this is not to minimize the importance of hospitals, they're critically important, all of them, but so is the Howard Center. So is the FQHC. And they don't have an opportunity to get the level of rate that the hospitals have. So we need equitable reimbursement. We need to put our money where we, our mouth is. If we value it, Let's pay for it, and you have to do that equitably, or you're not going to have it. Mm -hmm. And these are oh, let me ask. Oh, let me ask. well, the care board has started looking more broadly. We don't regulate these other areas, but 
we're looking more broadly and requiring insurance companies to have justifications for why they're paying one place one rate and another place another. And we're also being more mindful of hospital rate increases. Historically, in the last five years, we've seen hospital rate increases double inflation, double wages. That's not sustainable. But the math is like this. It's going to crash, and it is crashing today. The urgency. So these reforms that Dr. Levine spoke of, they're very well intended. They're very important. They may be very good, but they're going to take seven years. And we do not have seven years. It's today. Today, you have to change it. So the care board is trying to be very mindful of the rate increases, because if I give UVM 10% or another hospital 10%, Gina's paying for it, mm -hmm. and he's not getting it. Mm -hmm. So we have to be mindful of the whole system we're trying to do that, while not disrupting Steve's ability to care for their patients. Gina, what do you think about all this? Confident? You don't walk out here with I'm more just, I'm, One of the things that always strikes me is that um, on the consumer side, you know, you can't find a primary care, you finally get an appointment and you're like grateful. And like no one's doing anybody a favor here. I'm paying for a service. If I paid $150 a week for daycare and every Monday my provider said to me, I'm sorry, I can't take your kid this week, I, I wouldn't I would find something else. That wouldn't be providing a service to me. And so I think that you know, we are, we're so ingrained that healthcare is like something we have to accept. And I know my employees, I go over the spreadsheets and I'm like, I don't know what she's talking about. So many numbers, like I, I, they don't have the ability to like synthesize all that information and get what they're paying for or what they're not getting for the money that they're putting in. Um, and from a consumer standpoint, that's really frustrating. I don't have a choice to not have healthcare. I have a chronic illness. I have to have healthcare. And Last year, I hit my out-of-pocket maximum, and I went all in. I was like, let's do all of the things. Like, that's the problem with the system, right? But I'm like, well, I've paid three grand, so we might as well get a couple free MRIs. <laughs> you know? Because that's that's how the system is built. And so I think that you, you need to change, in some ways, consumer behavior as well, consumer understanding of the system. Why is it important that you have primary care that you see every six months? You know, why is it important that you go and see a dermatologist for a skin check once a year? Why, why are these things important? Get a stress test. Go get a CAT scan. Why do you abdominal pain? You know, why is it important to manage these things as you go? Um, and, and create a financial structure, which I'm sure we'll do in the next five minutes, where taking care of oneself in that manner is not a burden. And some of your plans do that, right? $15 copay for anyone you want to see, any specialist, any primary care, fantastic. But you have to know to be able to ask for those things, and you have to know how to get to them. And that's a level of education that I think your average health consumer just doesn't have. Well said. All right, let me, first of all, uh, anybody have a, want to jump in with any thoughts, any ideas that we have discussed? Um, one brief one that was signed yesterday in the law of Governor Scott was um, the Prescription Drug Advisory Board, which will be an attempt to regulate pharmaceutical prices. Colorado has been doing it, Maryland has been doing it. Governor Scott signed it yesterday. The Care Board will get resources to design a regulatory process to govern those prices. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Look, I deal with the drug companies. They'll, they'll blow you away in five minutes. We'll but, but I thank you for raising it. <laughs> is um, what can work? You and I talked to Dr. Martin. And often represents what, tens and tens of millions of mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've had a hearing. I had the three largest drug companies and the three largest PBMs in the same room at the same time. Uh, and of course, they were all busy blaming each other for the high cost of prescription drugs. And in fact, they are both absolutely responsible for it. Whether cahoots or not is the proper word, but they were all meant to each other's money. Uh, I don't have to explain to anybody here that we pay the highest prices in the world, plus the soy. What are you doing about it? Steve, you're part of our hospital association. You're part of Blue Cross Blue Shield, my God. How many tens of millions of people's Blue Cross Blue Shield represent in America? Tens of millions? Hundred million. Hundred million? You know, you got a little bit of leverage. Mm -hmm. Do you go to the insurance? You, uh, you work with Optum, right? You told me you thought they're doing a great job. Oh. Better job Relatively. Right. In terms of where we need to be and what's going on in the rest of the world, we, we are failing. What are you doing? Well, what, not just you, Percy. You represent the small state. Mm -hmm. Blue Cross Blue Shield is a major healthcare player. Are they actively telling the drug companies 
the charges with the charge of Canada? It's not ten times a month? Are they? That's my question. Yeah, I believe that they are. Really? Yeah, and then, yeah. you know, but, I didn't know that. but there's nothing that's constraining the drug manufacturers in, in this in this country compared to Canada and other countries. Look, right? I understand that the system is complete. I deal with every day. We're trying to make a little bit of progress and having many technical But you have a leverage. If you're 100 million consumers and you say to Nolan Norris, they're not going to pay a thousand dollars for a Zepic. You know what? They may listen to you. Has that occurred to Blue Cross Blue Shield? Naturally, I get your small thing. But you're part of the national team, right? We're part of the national team. As you know, unfortunately, the blue plans are separate and don't work well together. But your point is so well taken. I know my point is so well taken. Yeah. What are we doing about it? Well, we're gonna up, we will up our voice. I mean, I've, yeah. I've talked to the Optimum people since we talked. Um, we can raise our voice. The action you asked us to take can be taken. Um, I think that we could concede and support that there are drugs that should be new to the market, that should be uh, negotiated at a federal level. Has Blue Cross Blue Shield nationally made that point? No, I don't believe that Blue Cross nationally has made that point, no. Are you going to help us make that point? I would be happy to try to help. Steve, you're a member of a hospital association? Mm -hmm. So what I will say is that we are part of a group purchasing organization which helps. I will also tell you that even though we are big in the state of Vermont, we're not even a blip on the screen. And so that million dollar drug, we tried to negotiate down prices on them. They said, don't buy it if you don't want right. to. You're small nationally, but you're tied into hospitals all over the Yes. That's not small, correct? That's true. What are you doing? They are advocating. I'm not part of that on a yeah. daily basis, but there is some work going on. Some work. But I will tell you that. Oh, we, some yeah. work. Yeah. yeah. Some work. And why are high school, why are drug prices soaring if there's some work going on? You're doing some work, he's doing some work. Apparently you're not succeeding. Can I ask a question? Do hospitals mm -hmm. make profit off drug costs? Like for example, a lot of hospitals now have retail pharmacies and they get revenue on top of their costs. Is that part of the issues that hospitals nationally are profiting on selling drugs? So very commonly, uh, the retail pharmacy hospitals do make profit on. Very commonly, the DRG that someone comes in and gets admitted for, we probably don't make much profit on that drug. It's part of including that cost. Um, but yes, retail pharmacy is profitable. This is 340B. It's more than 340B, but 340B is a component of that. But yes, hospitals make money on their... their so it's three pieces. You have a retail pharmacy and you pay $170 million for the drugs. Then you sell them to your patients for 240 The hospital made $70 million. If you have a DRG billing, an episode of care, yes. and you pay X amount, you may have some extra money in there from the pharmaceutical costs. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Third, you get money from 340B. So UVM made I think, $35 million ish on 340B last year. So those are all ways the hospitals association nationwide can make money off of drugs. Although really we are not using that money for altruistic purposes. Other things that basically are not being covered. And on that note, just to say, Medicaid and Medicare not paying enough causes a massive problem with commercial insurance having to foot more of the bill. It's a regressive tax. It's taxation without representation. It's unfair to people. Okay. Um, all of which is true. Mm -hmm. Again, we're talking about a dysfunctional and wasteful system. Uh, all I'm asking we're going to pursue this, is understanding that we are a small state, okay, we're not big national friends. Let us try to play, go forward with a sense of urgency. Let's try to be the leaders in that, you know, you're small, of course, for shield them on. You're part of a large organization. Mm -hmm. You're a small medical center hospital, you're part of the American Hospital Association. They're big. All right? Take the leadership home. Tell them you can't afford to pay these. You know, she's paying for your high cost of mm -hmm. drugs. I'll go meet with that camera. Yeah, point out right. All right. Uh, all right, listen. Um, thank you very much for the work that all of you uh, are doing. This is tough stuff. Uh, and all I can say, I think, speaking for the vast majority of people in our state, the status quo is not working. We've got to change it. We've got to be bold. We have to be prepared to take on some powerful special interests. In all right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator.